Hey you. Yeah. You. You didn't stumble here by chance. So let's talk. My name is Tyann, but a lot of people call me Taj. And I'm most known for my loud New York personality. Brooklyn, to be specific. And my unfiltered opinions. And most recently, for being your favorite homegirl. Yeah, cause I'm a realtor too. Don't forget that. And the Melanated Mindset is a safe space for unpopular opinions and heated debates amongst the diverse melting pot of those of us that identify as a melanated millennial. Now, I can't speak for y'all, but after seeing what being an adult is really about, nah, I got some things to say. And I know y'all do too. So let's talk about it, because what's really going on? What is up, y'all? Welcome if you're new, welcome back if you're not, to the Melanated Mindset. It is another Monday in my favorite place, and I hope this is y'all favorite place too, especially if you show up and you meet me here every single Monday. I just have to take the time to say thank you for sharing space with me today. You could be anywhere doing anything. But you chose to be here with me today, and I am so, so, so grateful to have you. Oh, yeah, it is another early morning, but tell me why, y'all, it's Sunday morning. It is 6 a.m. on Sunday, as in, like, y'all are hearing this tomorrow. Like, why I keep doing this to myself, y'all? I now have to record, which I'm doing. And edit this episode by tomorrow because I like for the pod to go up at like 4, between 4 and 5 a.m. for my 5 a.m. girlies. So y'all could, you know, catch the vibes and kind of decompress with me before you start your day. Before I jump into this episode, I do want to say that I feel like today's episode and last week's episode are gonna kind of go hand in hand. So today's episode might be a continuation of last week's. So I highly recommend if you have not listened to last week's episode, episode seven, Nature versus Nurture, that you go listen to that one first and then come back to this one. Y'all know I always gotta start with a question. So my question for y'all today is why do you, yeah you, Why do you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders? Now, y'all know your girl is never going to miss the opportunity for a shameless plug. So if you are an OG part of the tribe, or if you would like to be, because I would love to have you, make sure you do me a favor and follow me on all socials to keep up with me in quote unquote real time at Tyann Watson on all platforms, and of course, make sure you check out my website, tyannwatson.com, to see kind of what I've been working on and what I have coming up, and so that you can read my blog post, because your girl is in her Carrie Bradshaw writing era, okay? So go ahead and check out those blog posts. I really do be dropping gems on there. Now, moving right along to our complaint and highlight of the week. And I think it's important for me to let y'all know that when I first scripted out this episode and planned this episode, I originally did not have a complaint of the week. And I was excited because I have two highlights of the week, but I didn't have any complaints. And then this morning when I went to kind of pull up my my podcast planner with all the things that I'm talking to y'all about, I definitely had to go in and add a complaint, and I'm kind of sad about that, but my complaint of the week is that, I told y'all, today is Sunday. On Friday, we took Davey, and if you're new here, Davey, Zavion, is our three-year-old son that we homeschool. I think that's important to note as well, but we took him to the park Friday afternoon because, it, I told y'all, it's back up in the 70s. And we had had a lot of rainy weather, so this was like the first good day of good weather, no jacket weather. So we're like, let's take him to the park. But we made the mistake of taking him to the park around like 3-ish, almost 4 o'clock. So we normally like to go to the park during the mid-afternoon, like noon, when the other homeschool kids are at the park. So at this time, all of like... All of the children are out of school. So the park that we normally go to 
is packed. And I'm instantly irritated because I don't necessarily like going to the park. If you're a parent, you you understand. Like, the park as a kid was so lit, but now I get it. Because it's like, you have to stay on high alert, number one. You know, make sure nobody runs off with your kid. You also have to stay on high alert for, like, the other kid's behavior. And then, like, the other parents. You want to make sure nobody's mistreating a child, talking to your child any type of way. And then your child is running from here to there to there to there. And we are active parents. We are not the parents that are just sitting on our phones at the park. No. So, either Malik or I are literally standing up going from, you know, jungle gym to jungle gym with him. Like, you know, just in the background making sure we got eyes on him okay and this is our only baby and if you've been here since season one you know how hard we fought to get this baby earth side so i'll be damned somebody run off with my baby at the park it's not happening okay but on friday we had an incident at the park where Xavier brought his little, like, Mario figurine. Like, you know, those those little teeny toys that, like, you know, fit in the palm of their hand. So he gets to the park, takes off running, doing his thing. You know, he's super excited. Like I said, he's homeschooled. So the only time he has other children interaction is when we go either to the park, to the museum, things of that nature. So he's excited. He's not, despite what people think about homeschool kids, he's not antisocial at all. He wants to talk and play with everyone. He thinks everybody is his friend. So he takes Mario up onto this playground and, you know, he was playing for a while. Malik and I are sitting at the bench at the picnic tables with all the other parents, but we're watching him and I'm watching him and he's having a good time. He's playing with this boy that doesn't seem like he wants to play with him. And that always irritates me when I see my baby go up to other kids and he doesn't necessarily ask like, hey, do you want to play with me? Like he just starts playing. He's showing you his toy. You know, he's just excited to be around other kids. But I could tell that one, this little boy was older. Xavier is three. This boy looks like he is about five or six. And this boy is also Caucasian. And that's an important part of this story. And I could just tell that he's he just keeps looking around like he's like almost like turning his shoulder like like he doesn't want to play with him. Like, why are you following me? But again, this is an older kid. So I understand that, you know, the older kids don't want to play with the babies. And there are a lot of other kids at the park. But for some reason, this is the boy that Xavier ran up to to play with. And at first he was like kind of shunning him off. Shunning him off. And I'm like, it's making me uncomfortable. But I'm like, okay, you know, Tyan, you cannot get involved like he has to know how to handle these type of situations so I'm just sitting on the bench peeping scene right and then eventually I guess he's like all right this kid's not really playing with me so he goes in the jungle gym and he goes to go down the slide and before he can like get to the front of the slide I kid y'all not like four or five also Caucasian boys step in front of the slide now instantly I jumped up like a jack-in-the-box because I don't like the way that this looks, right? I jump up like a jack-in-the-box, beeline over to the jungle gym. And I'm just standing at the, like, where the bridge is, because y'all know how the little jungle gyms be having the bridge, the bridge that takes you to the slide. And I am just standing there. I said, I'm still not going to get involved. I want to see how he is going to handle this. I want to see how this situation is going to go before I step in. But I want to make sure that I can hear what's happening because from where I was sitting I couldn't hear I could just see and if I didn't like the way that it looked probably not gonna like the way that it sounds so I am standing there and at some point Xavier sees me and when he turns his head to see me all the other boys turn around all of a sudden they part like the Red Sea and like I hear what sounds like his toy Mario get thrown down the slide but from where I'm standing I cannot see who threw it and then as soon as I like turn my head to look at the bottom of the slide I hear one of the boys go yeah he just threw that toy down there like woohoo and then as Mario comes down the slide that same little boy that didn't want to play with him grabs Mario and I'm looking like okay I'm still not gonna get involved Next thing you know, Zadion comes down the slide, and here goes that Caucasian boy that has his mile. Like, here, you want your toy? You got to come get it, boy. And let me tell y'all, he may not have had ill intentions, but as a black person first, and then a black mom to a black son, 
the way that he said, boy, it sent chills down my spine. And y'all know what I'm talking about. So at this point, I'm like, okay, all right. I am on a hundred percent high alert. I, I still have not intervened. I still have not said anything because again, he could, we do live in the South. He could just have an accent, you know, but I am extremely uncomfortable with the situation and now I'm starting to get irritated. So then Xavier thinks he's playing now. So Xavier takes off running behind him, chasing him for the toy. And I am just following them because I'm still not saying anything because as of right now, this could very well be innocent play. I see Xavier start to like get irritated. So I chime in and say, excuse me, sweetie, can he have his toy back? And the little boy ignores me and takes off running. And Xavion takes off running with him back on the jungle gym. So I'm like, all right, Tyan, it's not that deep. Then as I like go to walk around the jungle gym so I can see where they're at now, this boy is now standing at the like the steps of the jungle gym, right? And he's like, nope, you're not allowed up here. You, you want to get past, boy? You got to get past me. And he's like, like moving his hips like Xavier's trying to go left and right. And he's like jugging him to make sure Xavier can get to him. All of a sudden, I see the little boy's knee go up. I can't see if he connects to Xavier. I just see his knee go up. So at the time I see his knee go up, now I shout very loudly, excuse me, sweetie, can you not use your knee? And now all of the Caucasian mothers that have been sitting there on their phone on the bench have now, now everybody's paying attention because here goes this black woman standing up on this jungle gym saying, please, can you not use your knee, sweetie? And then this little boy still has not moved out the way. So I'm getting, I'm getting irritated now. Xavier goes back on the jungle gym, and here goes those same four or five boys. And mind you, these boys are also about five to seven, so these are bigger boys compared to him. They are just surrounding him at the top of the slide again. And I'm like, Xavier, come down the slide. And they're like, oh, your mama got to come get you, boy. Like, I can hear them. So now I'm like, you know what? My blood is boiling because it's it's becoming a race thing. And despite whether that's what they intended, because I understand that racism and those type of things is not something that's that you just pick up like it, it like it's learned. You understand? So it could be so ingrained in their household that they don't understand that this is not appropriate. At the, and Xavion is the only black boy on this jungle gym. So it's now turning into a full on bully situation. So I tell him to get down the slide and the little boy still has his Mario. So now I'm holding Zamion's hand and I'm walking around looking for this boy. And by the time I get to this, this little boy, his mom is going off like, I don't know. Let's just say little Johnny, little Johnny, that's not okay. And she's talking to him. And he's like, why are you talking to me? Y'all, y'all know how they go. So she is trying to have this stern moment with him and he is completely ignoring her. And he is like, and I walk over, excuse me, sweetie, can I have his toy back, please? In the middle of his mom talking to him. He's like, I mean, I was playing, but here, thank you. And I'm like storming towards Malik. And I'm telling Malik with our little military sign that he taught me a while ago, like, it's time to go. Like, it's time to go now. My blood is boiling because that's not okay. And then I look down at Xavion, his lip is bleeding. And at that moment, I began to see red and I wanted so badly to go off. And if you know me, you know, it don't take nothing for Taj to go, for Taj to come out. Okay. To go from zero to 100, especially behind my child. But in that moment, I had to instantly muzzle myself because I knew, I knew if I go off at this park right this second, I am going to become that black woman, that angry black woman. And keep in mind, we are the only black people at this park right now. And I told y'all, the park is packed. So if I would have went off, it would have been in front of all of these children. And Taj, four years ago, would not have gave a damn about nobody else's kid. But Taj, that is healing and as a mom that is spiritually conscious, I know that the first thing that these other parents, these Caucasian parents are going to say is, hey, can you relax? Like there are kids here. And now that I'm a mom, 
I understand that. I don't want my child at the park and there's some grown up cursing and screaming. So I get it. But I was so infuriated because there was so much I wanted to say. But then at the same time, I had to be honest with myself and say I did not see the knee connect, but something in me told me when that little boy lifted his knee that he need him, but I didn't see it. I didn't hear Davy say, ow, I didn't say none of that. So I could not, I could be upset because I don't know how all of a sudden his lip is bleeding, but I would be technically assuming you understand. And I, I'm too rational and too self-aware to know that you can't just go off when you don't have the facts because the first thing parents like to say is oh they're just playing they're boys and I don't be trying to hear none of that shit it would have made me mad so now I'm storming past Malik to go straight to the car and Malik is like what's happening what's going on like he saw me get up but now I'm coming back and he knows he knows we've been married 10 years he knows he's like what's happening talk to me what's going on and I'm like I will tell you when we get to the car but we're leaving now we get to the car. I'm explaining to him everything I just explained to y'all. And now I can see him getting pissed. And we're, he's putting Xavier in the car because I'm fuming. I'm so mad because have you ever been in a situation where you were mad but you had to contain it? And I, I felt so minimized because the only reason that I wasn't going off was because I was black. And I knew if I was a white woman in that moment, I could have went off and it would have been brushed off. But if because I'm a black woman, it would have been a bigger deal. It was a big deal. But you guys know what I mean. They would have made it that there goes that angry black woman. And I try my absolute best when I am in public to contain that because I it's not that I'm running from the stereotype. I just don't like to run into it. And again, this is a park filled with children right now. So I don't want to be that angry black woman in front of all of these Caucasian kids so that their parents could give them the talk in the cars like, you, you, you know, you, you know. And at the time, now I'm going through my head like, Ty, I know you're not crazy, but like, am I overreacting? Because that's exactly what they would say. And then as Malik is putting Xavier in the car and as I'm just pissed and like steam is practically coming out of my ears, a Caucasian woman and her son walk past us. They were parked right next to us. They were on the playground when it happened. And she stops me and she says, I know you're upset right now. And at first, I'm, I'm I, this, I thought this was going to be the straw that broke the camera's back. So I was going to cuss her ass out because what the hell are you following me for? She stops me. She said, I know you're upset right now. And I know you don't need anybody to speak for you, but I just want to let you know that after you stormed off, I had to say something to them because I watched all of that happen and that was unacceptable. And y'all, I almost wanted to cry because it made me feel like I know I'm not crazy. I know I'm not crazy when these things happen. And this is now the second park incident we've had like this. And I honestly don't like going to the park and Malik kind of gets on me. He's like, come on, babe. Like, I want to go to the park as a family. And I don't think he understands why I don't like going to the park until now. And I explained it to him after this. But that woman was like, that was unacceptable. And I know I could see that you were containing yourself. And that's when I, I stopped her and I said, yeah, because if I would have went off, I would have been that angry black woman. And the look on her face was like, damn. I didn't even think about that. And she just shook her head and nodded like, wow, holy shit. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And she's like, you shouldn't have to censor yourself when it comes to your child. And I was like, you're absolutely right. But you live in the world that I live in. And if I don't censor myself, I get a label, a nasty one. And she was like, I'm so sorry that that's your experience. But I just want to let you know that's why we're leaving. Because that was ridiculous. I hope y'all have a great day. And she packed her son up and they got in the car. And it was just so reassuring because, like, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. And if another white woman can see it, then I know I'm not crazy. And it takes more women like her to step up and say something and to actually storm out of the park with me, you know? And when I explained to Malik, this is why I don't like coming to the park because mommy sees things from a different perspective. And that's not to say I don't think Malik is ever like, you know, ignoring these things. It's just he's a dad. He sees it as, you know, the boys are rough playing. And I, I get it. But mommy sees the microaggressions that go on at these parks in the South that I don't like, that I'm not going to let fly. And I'm not going to let my child 
think that that type of shit is normal. I did not experience personal blatant racism until I was like 25 years old. And that was in Hawaii. The first time I've ever been called the N-word to my face has been in Hawaii. I grew up in the most diverse city in the world. And never in my life have I encountered racist people like I have living in the South and living other places. So my son will not grow up thinking that that type of shit is normal because it wasn't normal for me. Understanding that there are different people. I was exposed to different people, different cultures all around the world at a very young age, which is why I'm so adamant about Xavier on traveling and having those experiences. Because when your child gets to see more of the world, they don't grow up to be a racist prick. And I know that was really, really long, y'all, but it was, it was a lot. And I'm, as you can see, this Southern racist shit, I'm not used to it. I will never be used to it. But they don't got to worry. We ain't, we ain't going to be here too, too much longer. But that was my complaint of the week. I'm sorry that that took 10 minutes. But on a much, much lighter note, my highlights, because yes, I have more than one. My highlights of the week, the first one being, I had my first therapy session of the year on Thursday, and Thursday just also so happened to be a full moon, so it just lined up perfectly as far as, like, releasing a lot, and I really had the best session I've ever had yet, and after my therapy session, I literally sat in the car, and I broke down crying, because this is the first therapy session I've had since I started, where I didn't have anything negative to say it was all positives i haven't seen my therapist since november because y'all know december was hella packed so i was catching her up on the renewal and like all of the things and it was just i, I was just in such a great mood to the point where she was like what what do you want to achieve this session i was like i honestly just want to tell somebody all the good things I got going on. Don't have to worry about feeling like I'm bragging or don't want to have to worry about people feeling jealous. I just want to say all the good things going on. And like she was smiling ear to ear. It was such a, it felt like catching up with my home girl that is not going to feel no type of way about all the good things going on with me. I told her about that amazing meeting I had last week, Monday that went well. So things are moving well. As far as that, I just, it felt good. But the real reason it felt good is because I told her something else, which is my second highlight of the week. And that is, I got my first hit YouTube video, y'all. Like, I am so excited. Like, I literally am watching one of my videos blow up in real time. And it feels so so good not just because I need the exterior validation but because I put so much work planning and intention into the production of that specific video and it's just like although I'm excited I'm not surprised it was just my confirmation that I'm getting close I'm getting so close and I cannot give up now and I won't give up now because I stopped YouTube once before and back then I was monetized before you needed all these subscribers and watch hours so I was monetized on YouTube back when we did in Hawaii and I was pumping out content and then I, I stopped and I did not upload it all while we were in Italy and I'm, I beat myself up for that every time and here I am fighting tooth and nail to get monetized again and it just was my confirmation like by the time this video goes up tomorrow that video will probably be at 10k it is my highest performing video of all times. I have gained almost 200 subscribers in the past like three days. And if you're on YouTube, you know, like the numbers sound small, but on YouTube, that's a big fucking deal. And like, I am just so thrilled because it is literally only up from here because every day I'm getting new subscriber emails. I'm getting more comments. I'm watching the views go up every single day. And if you haven't watched that YouTube video, you really should because it's a really good video, clearly. And I'm not just tooting my own horn. The algorithm picked it up because it's a really good message. And I love that all of my comments are so positive. There's almost 100 comments and it's all 
positive. I was talking about how social media is making us hoarders and making us overconsume and how essentially we just need to stop buying so much shit. So if that's something you can relate to, head over to my YouTube channel, Tanya Watson. It's my most recent upload and it just gave me the fuel that I needed to keep going. I feel like the last couple weeks I've been telling you guys how my creativity has come back and how I've taken the time to learn more about my craft and like cinematography and editing and things like that. And I put it all to use for the first time in this, in this one video. And that is the video that's blowing up. Anybody that has had a goal or a dream and you start to see just the littlest bit of progression, it feels so, so good. So I'd appreciate it if y'all go run that video up some more because it really does have a good message. And it took me two weeks of filming, editing. Like I am, I'm creating short films on YouTube. I'm not just uploading willy nitty vlogs anymore. And clearly it's working. Y'all, that was a lot. I know, I know. I don't even know how long I've been talking, but we moving on to our Fendi fact of the day, okay? Today's Fendi fact is an article written by Children's Health, and it's titled, What is Oldest Daughter Syndrome? It reads, the oldest daughter in a family often faces a unique set of experiences. In the role of eldest daughter, a girl may have distinct challenges, responsibilities, and expectations. Due to this pressure, they may develop certain personality traits or even mental health challenges. This phenomenon is known as oldest daughter syndrome. Although it isn't a formal mental health diagnosis, it's a term that many eldest daughters can relate to, helping them feel seen and validated in their life circumstances. In fact, hashtag oldest daughter syndrome has 24.2 million views on TikTok. People are raising awareness about the quote unquote syndrome and helping fellow oldest daughters realize they're not alone in their struggles. Whether you're the eldest daughter in your family or a family member trying to understand the unique circumstances of the eldest daughter in your life, there's a lot that you don't know. And then it has some signs of eldest daughter syndrome. And it says, whether a firstborn daughter is in the throes of their caregiving duties or if they're adults now, they may exhibit many signs related to being the eldest sibling. Common traits and signs of oldest daughter syndrome include having a strong sense of responsibility, feeling a need for control, carrying the heavy weight of parents' expectations, perfectionism, struggling with same age relationships, Feeling resentment towards family, whether that be parents or siblings. Always putting others before themselves. People-pleasing behaviors, anxiety, and depression. Now, before I jump into the flow of things, if you enjoy the podcast, if it's helped you in any way, if you learned anything, if you get anything positive from this space, which I hope you do, do me a favor and rate and review the podcast on whatever platform you're listening to it on. It helps me out a lot. It lets the algorithm know that people need to hear the gems that I'm always dropping. It doesn't cost you anything but a couple moments of your time, because remember, time is money. And your review just might end up on my website as a featured review. Now, let's get flowing, y'all. So, I'm going to ask you the question that I asked you in the beginning. Why do you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders? So, if you read the title of today's episode, you know exactly where I'm going with this. You know exactly what the Fendi fact is saying. And although the Fendi fact was talking about eldest daughter syndrome, I want to make it clear that I'm not just going to be talking to eldest daughters. That's mainly who I'm talking to, but just firstborns in general. I am the eldest daughter, so that is why that is what I can relate to the most. But I know that for boys, if you're the firstborn, it, there's so much that comes with being the firstborn child, especially if you're the firstborn child to immigrant parents or first generation American parents. Like I said, today I'm talking to all of the firstborns, but I really want the, the oldest daughters to know I feel you, sis. I feel you. 
And a little bit of backstory for those of you guys who don't know. I, like I said, I'm the oldest daughter. I was the only child for 16 years. I'm the eldest of my of two of my mom. I'm the eldest of two on my mom's side. And I am still an only child on my dad's side. Add that to the fact that I grew up in New York City on top of the fact that both of my parents worked 50, 60 hour work weeks. And you get the fact that I was forced to grow up fast and alone for the most part. So I can't relate to those of you that had siblings most of your life. I wish I could. I remember using my birthday wishes to wish for a sibling. Ciao. Literally, like blowing out my birthday candles, wishing for a brother or a sister. Then by the time I finally got one, I was a junior in high school about to leave for college. And I love my little brother with all of my heart because I literally wished and prayed for him literally years before he came Earthside. I also spent so much time taking care of him before I went off to college because my mom had to get back to work. And... You know, now that I'm a parent, babysitters, daycare, that shit is expensive. Like literally daycare right now for Xavion would cost more than our mortgage every month. And I just cannot justify paying for that, which is why we homeschool him. I'm fortunate enough that we have that option. And when I was a kid, I remember there were so many times where I felt like it wasn't fair, like having to help out with my little brother, even though I prayed and wished for him. Like I said, I was a junior in high school. Like I was going out with my friends after school, going out with my friends on the weekend. But some weekends I couldn't because my mom had to work. And I was at home with this one-year-old. And my friends would be chilling and hanging out. But I was at home taking care of my brother, you know, helping my mom out. And it's not like my friends lived close. So I couldn't just like, oh, pack him up and like walk with him to my friend's house. No, my friends lived deep. Like I would have to lug him on the bus. And I just wasn't about to do all of that. So at some point, I remember that 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 hope, that like earning for a sibling, it it kind of turned into regret. And not regret towards my little brother himself, but just the way and time to which he came into my life, I just felt like it wasn't fair. Like, why now? You know? And it did eventually put a really big rift in my relationship with my mom because I remember being so mad at her because I couldn't understand. Why now? Why when I'm a teenager? Why when I'm literally getting ready to leave? Like, my college acceptances has started rolling in. Like, and I just remember thinking, how are you going to have time for him? When you didn't have time for me, you know, and I felt like he deserved the version of her that I didn't get a chance to see because she always had to work. And I never wanted him to feel how I felt growing up, which was often forgotten, overlooked, and most importantly, alone. And I know aside from that alone part, a lot of firstborns can understand like what it's like to just be overlooked and forgotten like oh you can handle that like oh you can do that like you become one of the adults at some point especially when another kid gets added into it all I ever wanted was someone to grow up with and now here he was so beautiful and innocent but the reality was we wouldn't get to grow up together the age gap was too big I'm now more of a mother figure to him and I was a sibling and I hated it because that's not, that's not what I prayed for. That's not what I wished for. You know, I wanted someone to do life with. I wanted someone to like complain about my mom with or to like surprise my mom with. Like I wanted that bond that only siblings have. And I, by the time I got it, it was, it's not that it was too late because he's still my, my brother. I, I love him with all my heart, literally. He was my, I always say he's my firstborn child before I actually had a child. But it just, this wasn't how I envisioned it. I didn't envision like having to sacrifice going out to be at home with the baby. I envisioned going with my little brother and sister, like, come on, bringing them to the functions. Like, don't tell mommy, you know, like that type of stuff. But there was nothing that I could do about it. The time came for me to leave to go to college. 
And I felt so, so guilty for leaving him there. Not that he wasn't going to be okay or or nothing like that. But it was just because I knew exactly what he would feel when he woke up the next morning and I wasn't there. It was an emptiness that honestly I knew all too well. Like at this point, my little brother was two going on three and he, he was used to me every day, all the time. And now I'm going off to Virginia State and I'm living on campus and I'm not going to see him for weeks, for months at a time. And I had no idea how that would feel for him because I don't know what it's like to have somebody in your life and then get them ripped out. And I know he was a baby, but I just remember feeling so guilty and hindsight is really 2020 because now that I'm a mom myself, I can say a hundred percent that what I was feeling was mom guilt. I was feeling mom guilt for a child that was not mine, but was part of me, you know, because I knew I was making the right decision for me and for my future, but I knew that my decision to leave home would affect him more than anybody else. And although I had an amazing time that first year away at college, like every frat party, every time I went out to the club, every time I had fun, I felt a little bit guilty. And yeah, he was only a baby at the time, but I just felt like I was having the time of my life and he was back at home reliving my lonely childhood. And then something happened that I could have never expected. I realized He wasn't actually living my very lonely childhood. He was living my childhood dreams. And from afar, I watched as my mom, rightfully so, progressed in her career because she's the hardest fucking worker I've ever seen in my life and she deserves it. But with that progression in her career, she was able to buy back some of her time. Boy, the way these episodes is all entangled, I promise y'all. It wasn't supposed to be this way, but I guess it was supposed to be this way. But as she leveled up in her career, got higher positions, she bought back a lot of her time. So now I'm watching them go on mommy son dates. As years go on now, I'm watching them go away on vacation. And the jealousy started to seep in. And that's the thing about being the firstborn. At some point, you have to watch your siblings get a version of your parent or parents that you never did. And you start to feel almost like a sacrifice. You know that they say, quote unquote, your firstborn goes through everything with you. And boy, oh boy, they mean that. And I'm speaking from the child perspective. But now that I'm a parent, uh, they mean exactly what they say. Your firstborn does go through everything with you. The oldest sibling gets to see the whole picture. Meanwhile, the younger ones only see the part of the picture that they're in. And it becomes a struggle because part of you as the oldest is so happy to see your siblings get the life you always wanted. But then envy and resentment towards your parent or parents comes knocking because all you're thinking is, why couldn't that be me? Why couldn't? life be like that when I was the kid and as the oldest you know that the younger ones aren't to blame deep down you never want them to feel that resentment at least I hope not like otherwise you're probably not that great of a person but you should never want the younger siblings to feel that resentment or that jealousy or to make them feel unwanted or unloved but at the same time you want them to know just how good they have it and that's where the fight becomes the big sibling versus the younger the older sibling versus the younger sibling because the older siblings are like you're ungrateful and you don't even know and the younger siblings are like okay insert waka flocka gif like okay And the older siblings are just so frustrated because, like, you have no idea what mom and dad or mom and dad sacrificed. You don't know that I was sacrificed so that you could live this life. I think that's where a lot of the civil rivalry comes from, from just living two completely different experiences, but maybe in the same house. 
it becomes very clear when you hang out with your younger siblings just how much you guys didn't get the same version of your parent or parents. It's almost like you were raised by completely different people. And anyone with younger siblings can relate, especially if there's an age gap of any sort between you. So when I hang out with my little brother, I'm just like, wow. Wow. Like, we really, really got two different moms, essentially, because we got her in two different seasons in her life. And I never knew how much that would affect us or like I never knew how much as a parent, the season that you're in, when you have your children, how much that affects them later on down the line, how much that affects your ability to have that nature versus nurture. I never knew how interconnected all of that was until I started, you know, my little brother is now 13, like until all of that started kicking in. And now that I'm a mom, I'm seeing just how crucial and critical parenthood is. How those first years make or break your child in the future. And how it is all interconnected. I've also learned that having younger siblings is a constant ego check. Because you have to consciously remind yourself when it comes to them. To move out of love and not out of ego, not out of jealousy, not out of envy, not out of resentment, because they didn't ask to be here, just like you didn't ask to be here. They didn't ask to have it good, and you didn't ask to have it bad. It's just, unfortunately, the cards that you were dealt, and as the firstborn, we had to go through so much with our parents. We had to be the test of our parents. Our parents had to learn how to parent in real time with us. And a lot of our parents didn't have the ability to go and heal their own childhood traumas. So in that firstborn, they instilled all of them unknowingly, just like I talked about last week. And then by the second, third kid, they start realizing, you know what? Mm. I could do this a little bit different. I could say this a little bit different. So as more children get added into the lineage, your parents start hopefully healing certain parts of themselves little by little that may not have been healed when you, the firstborn, were in the picture. And that is an ego check because nobody is to blame for that. They, being the younger ones weren't meant to live the life those of us older ones did. And anybody with younger siblings, you know what I mean. They are not built for the life that we were built for. And we may think we weren't built for it, but we were. Because we're here today in our favorite place, healing from it. But we know those sweet little younger ones who usually turned out for the most part to be the sweeter, softer ones if they were able to get the sweeter, softer version of our parents. They weren't built. They weren't built to be thugging it with, with our parents like we were. They they just not. And I love my little brother to death, but he's such a sweetheart. Such a such a sweetheart. And he he depends on my mom for everything as he should. But that's because she she's there physically. Whereas me, I had to depend on myself a lot because there was no one home with me. And I know if my mom's schedule was to completely change, it would be hard for my little brother. Like he's just not built for that. But that's a good thing. He shouldn't have to be, you know? And us as the firstborn, we had to be the sacrifice, whether we liked it or not. We had to be the ones that our parents learned to figure it out with. And there's no book that comes on parenting. And I'm telling y'all firsthand, they didn't know what the hell they were doing when they had us. They were trying to still live their same life, but add a human to it, as most parents do. And later on in life, they realized that probably wasn't the best decision, that they probably could have went about things a lot differently. Hence why the younger ones have a completely different version of them. 
Think about, if you are the firstborn listening to this, think about how much being the oldest shaped you into the person that you are today. You're probably a leader. You probably take take direction very well. You're probably just a lot more headstrong because you didn't have a choice to be. And those are some skills and some traits that maybe your younger siblings have to work a little bit harder for because they don't have the type of experience that you have. And I can wholeheartedly say that being a big sister absolutely prepared me to be a mother. Absolutely. And now I get to watch my son and my brother build a beautiful relationship since they are in fact closer in age than my brother and I. So I may not have been able to get the relationship that I wanted with my little brother, but now my son gets to have that. He gets to have an uncle that is only 10 years older than him. And he gets to have an uncle that feels like a big brother. And he gets to have someone to do life with. Someone who will always be able to relate to what it feels like to be a young black boy. Because at that point, my brother is just coming up in front of him, not too far. So he'll always have someone to call. And I absolutely love that for him. Because if I didn't have that, I at least want my children to have that. So essentially... My son is the reason that my little brother will never be as lonely as I was. And it's crazy how that works. Like, yeah, he's a baby now, but I could just see when my son is with my brother. Yeah, he may be a little bit annoyed because, you know, like, oh my God, here's this baby hanging around. You know, he's 13. I'm going to hang out with a three-year-old. But he just... It's fun. He has someone to teach things. He has someone to, you know, like, hey, let's go do this. Let's go do this. And that's all I ever wanted. So to watch my brother get that, it was the best gift I could give him. I just want anyone listening who is the firstborn to know you are not alone. We honestly need to start a support group for real, for real. But most importantly, you can't go back and change the past because if you did, you'd lose all of the lessons that came with it and the blessings. Your little siblings may be annoying here and there, but they are blessings. They taught you lessons. Being the firstborn and the oldest taught you lessons. And if you go back in time and change anything, you might not have those same lessons and experiences that you needed at this stage and in this season of your life and essentially clearly we were built for this we are the backbones of the family and don't let anybody tell you differently the firstborns we hold shit down and we hold shit together and that's on period today's word of the week is realize because if you're the firstborn i want you to realize that you were built different Because if you can handle being the firstborn, let alone the first daughter, you can literally handle anything. Our path was different because we are different. And if you're the younger sibling, realize that your older siblings have been through things they probably have never told you about. Understand that although you guys share the same blood and the same DNA, y'all do not share the same experiences. And give your older siblings some grace because it's not easy watching your siblings live the life you never did. But to my firstborns, my oldest, remember, God gives the hardest battles to the strongest soldiers. Cue outro. And on that note, if you made it this far, thank you for kicking it with me and chopping it up with me. I appreciate each and every one of y'all the love and the support it never goes unnoticed or unappreciated and if you want to join the conversation in real time make sure that you're following me across all social media platforms at tyann watson but more specifically make sure you're following me on instagram at tyann.watson because that's where i'll post all of the polls all of the questions and conversation starters that's also where you guys can expect to see sneak peeks and previews into the episodes to come we on a new season and we on a new level this gonna be one hell of a ride i hope y'all are ready until then i'll see you yeah you same time 
same place next week for another Melanated Monday. And remember, the goal is to be good and do good. Until next time, peace, y'all.